So it is 4.47 and we can, um, we can go back on the road. Um, welcome to the Venture Cafe again, everyone, and a very special welcome to everyone who is joining us for the first time ever. You're, you've chosen a perfect night to do that. Uh, Venture Cafe is a nonprofit organization. All of our content is free and open to the public, and this is thanks to corporate innovators who are supporting us, just like BA Systems who are supporting us tonight. Uh, it is our annual Defense Innovation Conference, and uh, I can't wait to introduce Megan McKeon, who is going to uh, moderate uh, four incredible startup pitches. Megan McKeon joined uh, BA Systems in February this year as the communications business partner for the Fast Labs R&D organization. She provides strategic communications counsel to the leadership team of Fast Labs. Prior to joining BA Systems, Megan served as director of development and communications at Boston after school and beyond a public and private partnership that expands learning, uh, learning and skill development opportunities for students. Megan, over to you. Awesome, thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here with everyone today. Thank you to uh, my colleagues from BAE Systems for your presentations earlier, and I'm really excited for um, the awesome sessions that we have coming from various startup founders. Um, so thank you all for being here. And I think with that, I will turn it over to our first speaker, um, Shay Sabrapour. Shay is the founder and CEO of CZM Astro Inc. in Austin, Texas. He has nearly three decades of leadership success in design, development, and execution of LEO and GEO telecommunications satellites, launch vehicles, and other interplanetary space vehicles. During his 24 years of service with Lockheed Martin Space Systems, Shea served as a design engineer, technology innovator, program manager, and ultimately the director of spacecraft design. So with that, I will turn it over to you, Shay, to get started. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Megan. Thank you, BAE, for uh, inviting us. Uh, let's see uh, if I can share this. Uh, um, my apologies. Um, uh, I'm trying to share, but uh, is there some? There we go. Okay, there we go. But you can see the. But you can see the screen. Uh, uh, it... Yes, we can. Okay, should I go ahead and start, start my video? There we go, sorry, sorry. thank you very much. <laughs> Perfect. All right. uh, again, thank you BAE, thank you for your attention today. My name is Shay Sabripour, uh, I'm the founder and CEO of Cesio Mastro. I started the company in January 2017. We're three and a half years into operation. Uh, our, our keen focus is design development, qualification and build of active phase, multi-beam active phase array technologies uh, for space and uh, aerospace applications, uh, not ground terminals, not, not 5G terminals, but rather aerospace applications. Um, we're a team of uh, 37 engineers, designers, and scientists. Uh, uh, 35 of us are in Austin, Texas, and uh, we just opened the Denver office uh, with two people just starting there. Okay. Uh, we talked a lot today about uh, Spectrum sharing and uh, efficient use of spectrum, that is something that uh, is the foundation of our company. Uh, uh, although there are geopolitical and FCC rules and ITU rules in uh, sharing the spectrum in a more efficient way, uh, I've always believed and, and will continue to believe that the day will come that the telecommunication will be transformed or packets of information will go from one user to the other on the other side of the world. In the, in, in the lowest latency, highest resiliency, and uh, highest security possible, regardless of what channel it takes. Uh, you know, we think of, the tele we, we think of uh, information systems as a distributed system, but unfortunately, telecommunication is still very stovepiped. And uh, the way we use spectrum should be more, um, uh, more resourceful and, and, and better utilized. Uh, channels, uh, frequencies where uh, can penetrate walls should be used as such and frequencies which does not penetrate atmosphere should be used appropriately and we should use free, uh, spectrum in a better way. So as we transition from 4G to 5G, as we trans transition from the kind of satellites in the middle that I worked on all my life to satellites like Viasat-1, which had more, more capacity than all, all other communication satellites or LEO or GEO constellations, the one common platform that I believe uh, will be used uh, in the next telecommunication transform is smart antennas 
active phase array technologies, software-defined radios. These technologies have been around for a long time. Uh, great companies like BAE and Lockheed Martin and other companies make great technologies like this. Uh, our challenge is uh, how do you marry the latest COTS technology chips that we've invested hundreds of millions of dollars and billions uh, in 5G and other technologies and marry the two and, and bring it to market at a lower price uh, and more capability. Uh, so we're transitioning from the kind of satellites I worked on all my life, multi-beams, uh, antenna farms and horns and other things to, to more refined multi-beam steerable uh, active arrays at, at, at lower cost. And uh, our challenge was, can we bring a lot more capability out of a box? Uh, in other words, uh, when you buy an active phase array system from large companies, you may still need a lot of PhDs and scientists to put it together to use on your platform, be it a drone or uh, autonomous vehicle or aircraft uh, or satellite. Uh, it, should, it should work out of the box where our users can focus on their mission and not uh, getting the key technologies to work together. So one of our pillars of our company was we build a product that has all the, all the functionality that all you should need is an ethernet cable, power cable, and you get steerable beam. So you should have the application array, the phased array antenna, the software-defined radio, the RF components, modem, channelizers, it's tall order, but uh, I'd like to show you uh, what we have done over the past three and a half years. We've come up with an architecture that allows you to pick your frequency so that you pick this, uh, the right antenna size Unfortunately, the kind of antennas are not quite software defined yet, but everything else should be software defined. You should be able to use common modules and from photons to bits, you should be able to configure a system for multiple customers uh, in a very um, uh, rapid fashion. And that's the architecture that we've come up with. The technologies that we've created so far from right to left are uh, modules that are, these are just to give you a size context, these are size of a credit card, uh, software-defined radio, four receipt channel, four transmit channel in a credit card size, software-defined radio um, with RAT tolerance uh, for LEO applications, a single board computer with uh, four or eight ARM cores, uh, up and down converters, and so on. There's an antenna for inter-satellite link, the one in the middle, the Nightingale series are multi-beam phased arrays in a flat tile platform. And if you want up to 16 beams independently steered, you get a little bit of a thicker box, but still a small box. And we use these in applications that we have right now, programs both in SBIR, small business innovative research, as well as some other programs with the Department of Defense and commercial platforms. From upper left, we have a program with NASA to put our first KA band phased array, deliver as a flight unit to NASA, Glenn, uh, this fall, which is a multi-beam flat aperture KA band antenna with all the software defined radio and all the functionalities out of the box. Uh, upper right is a six U mission that we have to demonstrate our technology with waveform switching that talk, was talked about earlier by one of the BAE folks that you can uh, rapidly uh, switch waveform between commercial and military applications and get the information low latency to our warfighter. Uh, lower right is an application of our S-band uh, antenna in AESA uh, in, a, in, a, in a different than communication uh, C4ISR mission. We, this was a program that we did for uh, DARPA Blackjack program. And lower left is application of our product um, to drones and other applications. We also have uh, several applications in commercial aircraft connectivity and, uh, and other applications. I'm sorry if I went very fast. I wanted to make sure to leave enough time uh, for questions and answers. Great, thank you so much, Shay. That was great. Um, so folks in the virtual room, uh, this is a period of time where um, we have a couple of minutes for questions. We can probably do one or two um, before moving on to our next presentation. And I should say that, you know, if you're interested and your question is not answered um, during this session, please, you know, connect with Shay on LinkedIn or, or other founders on LinkedIn or um, reach out to Yulia at Venture Cafe um, for an introduction. Lots of ways to, to connect um, to learn more after the session. Thank you. So I do, so Shay, I do have one question in the queue here. Um, what is your experience with radiation hardening or radiation tolerance in your electronics? All of our, our, all of our products are tested uh, right now for LEO environments. Uh, we started out with proton testing and we'll eventually go uh, to uh, 
a high radiation environment for both MEO and GEO applications, but so far for uh, up to five year missions in LEO, our products have been tested. All of our uh, components uh, are upgraded COTS uh, from avionics grade, but also tested for LEO environments. Both FPGA and all the other components have been tested to, to these uh, sort of up to five years. We have a roadmap. All of the RF uh, components are naturally rad hardened. Uh, without getting into the technology details, are naturally rad hardened uh, specifically. And then we select components that NASA has tested already or we test them ourselves and get them into LEO. Uh, we do have a roadmap for geo radiation hardness as well. Great, thank you. Thank you. Um, folks, if you have a question, um, definitely put it into the chat feature. See another one coming up here. Uh, what waveforms do you have experience integrating? We have in incorporated uh, traditional waveforms in uh, BPSK, QPSK, and are finishing up, uh, started out on our uh, uh, DVBS2X uh, protocol so, so that we can have higher order modulations. Uh, our DVBS2X uh, is not ready yet, but uh, we can certainly uh, look at any modulation and waveform you'd like that uh, um, uh, b both in both the in DOD applications and, and, and commercial. For example, we have a Link 16 program uh, with, with the folks at, um, uh, in San Diego at Spaywar. Uh, so we've, we've started looking at some MIDS uh, uh, waveforms uh, and others as well. Um, Great. All right. Um, folks, if you have additional questions, I do encourage you to reach out to Shay. Um, I think we are going to, uh, for the purposes of time, move on to the next speaker. But Shay, thank you so much for joining us and, and for um, giving us an overview of your company and your products. My pleasure. Really thank you. It. My pleasure. Thank you very much. Excellent. All right. So with that, I will move on to our next speaker, John Conrad. John is Vice President of Government Sales at Morpheus Data, where he leads strategy and execution into the government marketplace, working with customers, traditional partners, system integrators, and strategic alliances. Prior to joining Morpheus in early 2019, John spent seven years at VMware, leading a team covering strategic programs of record within the Department of Defense, focusing on Air Force and combatant commands, driving digital transformation through virtualization and cloud computing. Prior to VMware, John held key strategic sales leadership roles in the government marketplace at Microsoft, Oracle, Sun Microsystems, and Silicon Graphics. All right, John, thank you so much for joining us, and I will turn it over to you. Thank you, Megan, I appreciate it, and thanks for having me today. Can you see Megan? And we can see your slides. I just saw you on video. You went away though. There you go, perfect. All right. Well, thank you for having me today. I appreciate the opportunity to present uh, the Morpheus story and our product and where we fit into the C4ISR community and, the, and why we're relevant in that space. Um, Morpheus, is a five-year-old company. We have about. The Crime Victims Rights Act. I'm sorry. Is there a question? No. Um, five-year-old company. We're approaching a hundred people at this point, and we really focus on enabling the agility to have both an on-premise and cloud experience through hybrid cloud management. And why that is, is relevant is as the Department of Defense and the intelligence community uh, is focused very much on staying ahead of our adversaries. And what, what's required to do that, as we all know, is application redevelopment, application transformation, and, and new application development, as everyone is really trying to figure out how to manage on-premises uh, instances of software, be they dispersed across the globe, and 
also trying to figure out how to migrate to a cloud-based environment and how to manage all of the pieces in between that from a development life cycle to test and delivery, um, security, efficiency of cost, and also being able to manage multi-tenancy control of uh, security, all the different aspects of, of developing and delivering af applications to the warfighter. And Morpheus really has an advantage in the area of being able to provide that control and command for all of the different aspects of the life cycle of application management and, and delivery across uh, hybrid cloud, on-premise, public cloud, government cloud, and so we enable really the Department of Defense and integrators like BAE and others to act much like startups in rapid application development, no matter where the applications are reside and where you want them to land, which is of course very important as we try to create speed and agility and efficiency to the warfighter. Uh, one of the examples of that is the United States Air Force uh, chose Morpheus as the application uh, platform uh, for cloud management to transform from on-premise uh, activity for all of the weather activity around the globe to a cloud-based uh, solution. And Morpheus was chosen because of our completely agnostic approach uh, for both hardware, software, and applications. And these are some of the other companies that have done similar uh, transformations utilizing Morpheus as a cloud management platform. So the next slide, this is really representative of any complex data center today in any complex environment. This actually happens to be a slide that one of the combatant commands that we work with uh, had on a giant poster on the wall as far as what their data center looked like. And as you try to bridge all of these pieces together to create agility and the ability to manage both an on-premise uh, environment and a cloud environment, when you start to really look at all the different components of this, when from an on-premise infrastructure, from a hardware perspective to the public cloud and everything that happens in between from IT service management, identity management, configuration management, logging, application management, infrastructure as code, all the different hypervisors, container applications, all the different pieces that really make up a complex data center. Most, most DoD and integrators will admit they'd like to have a software defined data center, but what they really have is a software defined capable data center, but taking the last few pieces of all of these that expose interfaces that can talk to each other, but pulling those together and defining and being able to provide that end-to-end -end, uh, visibility. I don't believe there's a single pane of glass anywhere, but we like to say that we're as close as you can get to be able to manage, monitor, and pull all of this together for a self-service experience and a unified agnostic approach regardless on which cloud, which hardware, uh, which tool sets you use today. Um, our, our software creates the ability to tie it all together very simplistically. The landscape, of course, uh, traditional cloud management platforms are very ops centric. And what we've endeavored to do and done a very nice job of is pulling together between the operations side and the development side uh, with all of these different tool sets. And in, in most cases, we either tie these together seamlessly so that they can be managed and operated from a single cloud management platform, or in many cases, we will replace some of these technologies. But the goal is to be able to take a developer in a development environment that like to move very fast and not have obstructions in their way as they redevelop or develop applications as they run into operations management that typically slows things to get to the warfighter to tie the two together to re enable rapid development and rapid deployment uh, regardless of what infrastructure or what cloud that would run on. And we focus really on 
personas so that we man we can address all the different pieces that's important to the DOD and the IC community. Being able to have uh, the ability into cost across the clouds to be able to optimize and determine what where's the best landing zone? Where should I have my applications or my development environment? Be able to see that very clearly. And the, the next persona being SecOps, of course, security, compliance, policy management, whether it's in a tenancy or it's in a cloud or it's at the user level, uh, the ability to control those so that there's not risk to the platforms being compromised is very important. And the other piece of this is because we've provided the ability to land on any platform completely agnostic, uh, if there are hardware vulnerabilities that are identified and uh, a command or an operation needs to quickly switch to another platform, it's completely transparent and can reduce the risk of vulnerabilities from one platform to another. The next persona is that the enabled the cloud ops teams have to enable a cloud-like experience that's transparent to the end users in any kind of environment, whether it's public or private. And the last persona, of course, is that developer that just wants access to the tools and be able to develop unobstructed um, and be a first-class citizen. And we focus on all of these different personas and tie them together in a unified approach. So from the full life cycle, as I mentioned, we provide automation, which provides basically a seamless portal to, for anybody to gain entry to. But we do that through four different pillars, analytics to be able, and discovery to be able to easily consume the environments immediately, discovering on-premise hypervisors, Kubernetes containers, cloud assets, and be able to show those immediately and consolidate things together and provide right sizing and costing around all the different components that are consumed into our cloud management platform. The governance layer, which of course, uh, in most cases, that's the most difficult piece to get your arms around to have governance and security wrapped around all of these different cloud environments, no matter where they reside and the full life cycle from developer all the way to delivery. We do that through fine-grained role-based access, whether that be in a multi-tenant environment or clear down to a user level. Uh, the policies through the entire, entire life cycle are uh, customizable and very strong to provide governance wrapped around everything that needs to be managed. Automation, which is the core in the development phases as things are being redeveloped or moved to a cloud from an on-premise environment the automation capabilities of providing developers access to the code, the, the development tools and the CI CD pipelines that they want and transparently be able to manage the entire pipeline all the way through dev test, pre-prod and production uh, in a seamless and very fast uh, agile approach is the automation engine that is the core to the platform. And then finally, of course, we have to manage the production environment once things are up and running uh, to support the warfighter, to be able to scale as needed, to monitor performance, to monitor problem resolution, to be able to do logging, backup, task execution, to do workflows and things uh, that would be patch management or things like that is all part of the day two operations that are very important to this full life cycle that we manage in a, a full cloud setting. So that's, it in a nutshell, our real goal uh, and in the, the government market space is to really provide that agility and speed to be able to assist in redevelopment, replatforming, rehosting of applications and manage it from uh, end to end uh, as the government tries to automate and do much quicker through OTAs and SIBRs. Uh, we provide the ability to tie things together very rapidly um, regardless of platform, cloud, application, and drive simplicity and, and speed to the DOD. Awesome, thank you so much, John. Really appreciate your, your overview.
All right, folks, um, if you have a question, feel free to put it into the chat. I think I can probably take one question um, in this time slot. All right. Don't see anything coming through at this time, um, but John, we really appreciate you coming and speaking to us about Morpheus and uh, folks in the room, please connect with John uh, after the session if you have more questions to ask and uh, just appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Great. All right, I will slide over to our next speaker, Joshua Willett. And Joshua is the co-founder and CEO of Raven Black. Before founding the company in 2016, uh, Joshua spent 12 years in the United States Air Force as a special operations pilot, flying the MH-53 Pablo and CV-22 Osprey. He holds a BS in aeronautical engineering from MIT and a master's degree in political management from George Washington University. Joshua, thank you for joining us, and I will turn the floor over to you. Sounds good. Thank you very much. Yep, so I'm Josh Follett, uh, CEO of Raven Black, and we build what we refer to as high-velocity software for defense. As I click, there we go. So you see pictures like this all over DoD. This is every operation center, every intel cell, every exercise white cell. Like This picture happens everywhere, where I've got a couple of airmen, sitting in front of multiple computers, uh, multiple keyboards, multiple monitors, dealing with stuff coming in on an entire, like a whole variety of just isolated networks. And at the end of the day, the computers aren't connecting the people, the people are connecting the computers. And that worked for us well enough in Iraq and Afghanistan, and we were fighting wars that took place over years. And I think everyone knows it would be catastrophic if we couldn't respond faster and be more agile in a near peer uh, conflict. And those are out there. So super common thing here. And with ABMS or JADC2, or what I guess is now a defunct acronym of multi-domain operations, the idea is all about how do you take all of those disparate systems, get them into one place onto one system of record, you know, have rich data sets that you can use for ML training and algorithm development, start augmenting human expertise you know, with, with ML and AI. How do you get this low latency, ultra high availability, ensure security, have this operating in a cloud and local environment? And how do you then deploy that from the operations desk all the way up to the situation room so you have a coherent system? And at the core of what we think the answer to that is our system, which we call Ether, which is our data management architecture designed exactly for this problem of taking dozens and dozens of disparate systems, putting them all together in one place and then doing things with it extremely rapidly. Conceptually, it's very simple, right? I've got a whole bunch of inputs on the left and then I have downstream applications on the right, again, from analytics to intelligence workflows to a UI for an operator. Uh, pretty simple problem here. But where this gets fiendishly complex is for the partner that we've been developing Ether for within DoD, uh, they have asked us for something that supports 300 data sources as a starting point uh, with less than one second of latency. And that becomes an incredibly hard problem. That's very different than here's my one or two data sources that come in, go into a model, and I put it together in a UI, 300 plus, All right? And if you're going to do that, you need to start on top of an entirely modern tech stack. And we've done that. Everything we use is open source. And, you know, for example, like we use Go as our primary language, uh, protobuf for all of our internal communications, things that are extremely performant and modern and ready to go to scale to that challenge. And whenever you see slides about this, this kind of general topic, you see some sort of network diagram like this. I've seen it a couple times today in this discussion of here are all the nodes and they all interconnect. Um, that's a fine way to view mesh networking. That is a terrible, terrible way to view a data architecture. In fact, I'll go so far as to say, if you want to get past five or 10 data sources and you have an architecture diagram that looks like this, you have failed. You will not get there. And the reason is pretty simple is that the devil in all of this is the complexity of the interactions between all of those systems and models, right? So a little bit of simple math here, right? As I add nodes, the complexity grows exponentially, right? Here we're at four, and if we add that fifth node, that already takes us to 20 connections. So each of those is a service you have to implement, an interface you have to define, serialization and deserialization code, it's a performance bottleneck, it's a security risk, 
and this is at five. And if you start talking about driving this up to 300, all of a sudden, like all of those problems just become intractable. So you have to aim for simplicity. You have to have a different architecture that just does not allow that exponential complexity to take over because it will stop you. So very briefly, uh, the way we handle that is we don't let things branch. And we treat all of our data like a very fast traffic circle and a lot less like a network of independent nodes. And when you kind of start taking this approach, all of a sudden you realize you have some really interesting things that you can do. Um, key point here, everything comes in at the front of the funnel, including data coming from either external sources or even internal analytics models when they push stuff back to the beginning. There's one path here. You have one ingest layer that you optimized. You have one intermediate cache layer that you optimize. You have one output cache layer that you optimize. And if you can keep these things separable enough, they don't even need to know about each other. So all of those interconnections and the interdependencies disappear. Now all of a sudden you have something that scales much more linearly and a whole lot less exponentially. Um, and this is really what Ether has been built to do. It doesn't mean you only have or have one of these. It doesn't mean it's a monolith, but it means that you just take this fundamentally different architecture in terms of how you do this. And at the end of the day, we can build incredibly fat uh, data pipelines here from left to right. And more to the point, we also believe that this isn't something that should be recreated over and over and over. We know how to do it. We've worked through it. So we are pushing a concept that we call open source for defense applications, which is to say, how do we open source this within the United States based defense industry so that this becomes something other people can use? Um, not, we are, we're looking for partners to actually use our software, but we're also looking for partners who are interested in figuring out how to participate in this uh, inside and outside of government as an open source within kind of our community project. But at the end of the day here, slides are cheap. So I'm going to stop sharing that for just a second. And I'm going to pop over here. Um, in this context, I can't give a whole lot of detail about um, the purpose behind this. But this is a system built on top of Ether. I'll give it just a second to load up data. Um, what we have achieved here is Ether is taking in every radar that belongs to the FAA in the country. There's over 300 of them. They come in in a variety of a couple dozen, dozen different formats. And Ether is able to take this, take all that data, put it through a tracker, which was developed by our partners at BAE Fast Labs on this project. So they did the target tracking to actually turn dots into paths of airplanes. And we are able to uh, process every radar return in the continental United States in 80 milliseconds. Right, so faster than a human really even realizes what's happening. We've taken that, we've converted it into our standardized format, we've put it through a target tracker, and we've put it out to our UI. And most of the latency of what you're seeing here is just my network connection back to AWS. So it's an incredibly high throughput system. And every day we're layering more and more modeling onto this. Very shortly we'll be doing object classification, motion prediction, and all of these things just add one more layer to that loop back. And it ends up being incredibly fast uh, incredibly performant. And, you know, I'm showing you right here that this isn't vaporware. This is actually running on a tremendous volume of data with extremely low latency. Uh, this is a radar based example, but to us, geospatial streaming data is geospatial streaming data. This could be SIGINT, this could be imagery, this could be any number of data sources. And as far as Ether is concerned, you know, the, the difference between those things is the parser, the models, and how we put it into the UI. But fundamentally, that's what we build. Um, well under time. Questions? Great. Thanks, Josh. Awesome. So we do have a couple questions. Um, I can probably get to two in our, in our time slot here. Um, so the first one I had come in was, how do you normalize data across 300 plus data sources? Protocol buffers are your friend. Um, what we end up doing, uh, we spend an inordinate amount of time wrestling with interface control documents for whatever format the data is coming into us in. And then our goal as quickly as possible with that ingest layer is to get into a protobuf format. Uh, for anyone who's not familiar, you can kind of think of it as serialization as code. So you write a definition file that has the fields and everything, and then it automatically generates all of the parsing files for whatever language you're using downstream. So when we want to give data to someone else, we did the hard work to take this from obscure 1970s vintage radar format and then all we really have to do for you to be able to parse it as a downstream system is to give you that protobuf definition file. You can use it to compile uh, a decoder for whatever language you need. It takes about 30 seconds 
and then you can automatically read all of that data. But protobufs are your friend. And then the other concept is we organize things into what we call geo streams, which are we're kind of bucketing the data as it goes through into bits of data that you know relate to an area at a specific period of time. And it's really between those two concepts that we normalize all of it. Great, thank you. And then the second question, um, how does this operate across multiple security boundaries in real time? So right now we are operating across GovCloud and commercial AWS. And since those things have you know, pretty good network latency between them, like the image you're displaying here, a lot of the processing is export controlled. So it actually takes place on GovCloud and that 83 milliseconds includes that full round trip. Uh, we're working through with our partner what deployment across actual classified networks is going to look like, but it's going to follow that same basic model. Great. Excellent. Um, well, folks in the virtual room, I encourage you to connect with Josh uh, if you have more questions or you want to learn more. Thank you so much, Josh, for joining us. We really appreciate you um, sharing this with us. All right. And I am going to turn over to our last speaker of the day, um, Adam Kaplan. Adam is the co-founder and CEO of EduBees. He co-founded and served as an executive in technology companies, including Zenex Inc., which was acquired by Biotime Inc., Athos, which was acquired by BlackBerry, Digital Guardian, and Tonian, which was acquired by Primary Data. He has over a decade of corporate strategy and B2B sales experience in large technology companies. Adam graduated with honors from Occidental College with a Bachelor of Arts in Economics and Diplomacy and World Affairs. All right, with that, Adam, I will turn it over to you. Thank you for joining us this evening. Hi there, everybody. Uh, nice to meet you. I guess here I'm the last one. So uh, I'll hopefully uh, give you guys a good uh, short presentation. Um, so my name is Adam Kaplan, and I'm co-founder and CEO of EduBees. So uh, we provide visual intelligence technology. Uh, for those of you in the DoD world, essentially what we do is we geo-rectify data where we, act, uh, where we can take data and take a pixel and put it in its right geospace. Um, we actually, believe it or not, started off as a gaming company and then very quickly moved into the public safety space. So as an example of what we do, um, we've all seen these scenes of floods across uh, Hurricane Irma, Hurricane Michael, uh, things like this, and getting that situational awareness for those people when they uh, have these incidents is quite difficult because similar to the speaker who just uh, was previous to me, uh, there are many points of data. So what do we do? We take all sorts of data and we fuse it together. So during the hurricanes, we were able to augment the street maps, take the real time data and take the GRG and show in real time the ability to fuse data and georectify this data uh, over the, this video. So we were able to save a number of lives during Hurricane Irma and Hurricane Michael in the public safety sector. Um, so in other types of incidents, we've also been working in the public sector during the fires. These are scenes from um, Australia, where our software was used during the fires in Australia, where we would uh, actually the pilots of um, small drones were able to place markers as to where um, the fires were located, and they were able to drop markers or have automatically listing as to where buildings were burnt down, or green where buildings were saved, yellow where they were partially damaged. So all this information then is pushed back to the geospace. And this was during in Sydney, Australia, um, in us in uh, in January timeframe. Um, uh, so this was a quite a, an interesting experience for us. Um, so once again, during these types of incidents where you've got these uh, videos and you're trying to understand your situational awareness, our software is put into play. We're able to take those geospaces and understand in real time what you're looking at and understand, give that situation awareness to the operators, the analysts, people on the ground. Um, so this is something that's been uh, been put together. So during this incidents, we've been able to take a look at, um, well, during the fires in Napa, we actually uh, managed to start working with the um, uh, California Air National Guard and they saw our software. And what we did was we were able to take this reference imagery and then have the ability to geo-register the data very, very accurately. 
So what we're doing is we're taking this and finding the accurate location in a 3D space and able to give you less than one meters accuracy, even if you're at 30,000 feet. Uh, I'll skip over some of the uh, technology stuff, but a few other types of videos that I can show you is this is uh, a small craft aircraft where we're able to take ESRI uh, data and the sensor data for anybody is, who's aware of this is very inaccurate coming off of the manned or unmanned aircraft. And what we're doing is we are uh, using computer vision algorithms to lock on to these streets, lock on to these um, um, key landmarks to put on this real time video and reduce the uh, clutter uh, for instead of looking at multiple screens and we're able to track um, all of this information. So the software is being used in uh, um, a number of different scenarios. In this case uh, here, we're looking at an MQ-9 video uh, where we're able to take in real time and fuse onto these streets and lock onto um, uh, these, these information where you can now, you can toggle this information on, toggle it off, add uh, points of interest. All this is being done in real time. And in many cases, we're reducing from three, uh, three to six screens all the way down to one screen where, because as human beings, we're built to be looking at one screen at a time. So these computer vision algorithms are being used and we're a software solution that is platform agnostic and we're able to be used on uh, anywhere from an M a large MQ-9 all the way down to a small uh, UAV. Um, so those are some examples to, as to how the software is working. And once again, this is uh, geo-registering the data. Um, so um, other types of, uh, we is once again, able to take multiple uh, screens, data sets, and fuse. In these cases, we're able to take all these different six screens and fuse this all into one video where we can put onto a map and understand where is the street maps, the pattern of life of uh, on there, and put the GRG, uh, all this in real time on the video. Um, so this software, once again, is being, uh, is, is being used in a number of places within the DOD, as well as the public safety and in the commercial industry. And I'll show you some other interesting examples of the ability to visualize where a pipeline may be in the oil and gas industry, the ability to understand geo-registered data in the agriculture. Some other future, uh, some other things that we're doing is in CCTV, where you're able to understand uh, the street names and the, the numbers of the buildings. Um, we're also now working in future developments on synthetic aperture radar, the ability to georectify uh, data and put it on, on SAR imaging. And so the, the most fun thing we've done is our software is being used actually by the PGA tournament. And we're actually, we're georectifying golf balls from taking the drone feeds and showing uh, how uh, comparing golf shots. So um, we work in a variety of different use cases. Um, primarily our business has been in the, um, has been in the Department of Defense, um, but we are currently working with a number of different customers and partners in public safety and aerospace companies. Um, and that's it. So happy to take questions um, for anybody who's got, I would like to learn a little bit about how our visual technology works and we can move from there. Awesome. Thanks so much, Adam. That was great. Um, I do have a couple questions teed up here. I know we're up against time, um, but I, I will ask one um, that came in. And the question is, how have you overcome challenges with pixel-based geo-registration over varying ground cover, urban, forest, desert, et cetera? Um, so for the most part, we are using uh, reference imagery. Um, so we use reference imagery, and we're able to compare and contrast and what we do is we are, have the ability then to uh, lock on to key landmarks. So we've had incidents where we'll be locking on to a plant or even a, a, or a mountain and things like this. So we, the actually urban is actually an easier thing for us where we struggle sometimes is when we have no imaging whatsoever, like a, a desert or a, uh, or a uh, out at sea is where we struggle to find some of these things. But for the most part, that's, that's where our software is being used. Awesome, thank you. And one more question. Um, any use of machine learning to interpret and register imagery? Yes, we're using um, machine learning. 
for uh, besides the computer vision and machine learning is being used to identify where is a house, where is a you know a tree to under to make sure that we're not take, putting data and we understand what we're looking at in order to use machine learning, especially for the pitches of the various uh, angles that we're looking at. Great. Thank you very much for joining us, Adam. Appreciate your time. And to all of our um, speakers from the startup community, thank you so much for taking the time to give overviews of your really, really interesting technologies. Um, I know I speak for BAE Systems that we appreciate learning more and um, you'll likely be hearing us from us. Um, but thank you all and thank you to Venture Cafe for having us. Yulia, I'm sorry I went over time, but I will turn it back over to you. Thanks, everybody. No, this was great. Thank you so much for moderating. And thank you to all of our presenters, moderators, everyone who pitched, who shared their insights. A huge, huge thank you from us and, um, and all of our attendees. Those who attended, thank you so much for attending. It was a wonderful conference. Uh, I am going to share my screen for just uh, 10 seconds. If you have a minute, could you please hover your phone over the QR code you're going to see and let us know how we did today. It is a one question survey and it's super helpful for us. Uh, if you would like to continue networking, our global networking space is still open and I believe it's going to be open until, until 8 p.m. After I'm done sharing my screen, I'm going to share the link with you all.